They called it the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. They came from all over America, Negroes and whites, housewives and Hollywood stars, and senators and a few beatniks, clergymen and probably a few communists. More than 200,000 of them came to Washington this morning in a kind of climax to a historic spring and summer in the struggle for equal rights. This evening we tell the story of America's biggest civil rights demonstration, how it began, how it went, what it accomplished. The marchers gathered this morning on the broad lawns around the Washington Monument. The weather was perfect, 77 balmy degrees. There was a picnicky holiday spirit as the crowd grew. People waved to people they didn't even know, and they made the V for victory signs to the television cameras. The crowd grew slowly, still under 100,000 at this point, but on the outlying streets, the buses were moving in bumper to bumper. And I'd like to ask Ms. Horn first, just how do you feel on a day like this? Very, very uh, intense, to put it mildly. Um, we all shook up because it's so wonderful. Do you feel as though you have any kind of speech that you want to make? Oh, no, freedom, that's all, freedom, freedom. freedom. Yeah. Do you feel that this is it? It's thrilling, it's very thrilling. This is the beginning again, another beginning. Another beginning. Tomorrow more. Yeah. You don't have any sense that this might be a false beginning, do you? Oh, no, uh, I think if anything this does say, it is that uh, there are to be little Washingtons all over in every nook and cranny of this country. In fact, uh, we are thinking at this time about organizing a march through the Black Belt of Alabama and Mississippi because until the people in the Black Belt, the Delta, the least Americans uh, can be free, then the American on the best streets can't be free. So that uh, this isn't a, a climax and a fade off. And uh, I think the message to the country is free yourself by freeing us. I introduce the march now. was supposed to Mr. move Mr. out Mayor. at 11.30. But a few people decided to wander on ahead and try for better seats. And then a few more followed, and suddenly the march was underway. Its surprise leaders, caught back in the crowd, had to run to catch up. And some wags found a symbolism there. The parade was ragged, meandering, and good nature. Sometimes it looked more like a parade of signs and of people. The sign said, we demand equal rights now, and we demand an end to police brutality now. And no U.S. doe to help Jim Crow. I let my legs do most of the talking. Thank you. That young man had roller skated all the way from Chicago, a thousand miles in 10 days. The crowds shouted, chanted, we want jobs. As to violence, it never materialized today. Scores of marchers did collapse from heat and excitement, and they received emergency treatment. The long-awaited march for jobs and freedom on Washington, D.C. has started, and it started early without its scheduled leaders. About 10 minutes ago, the march began, broke out of uh, the grounds around Washington Monument, and without uh, Philip Randolph and his nine colleagues, about half of the 100,000 estimated crowd headed off down Constitution Avenue, headed toward the Lincoln Memorial, which is where we're seated now. It is here that the uh, climax of the march will come later this afternoon. Right now, you can see the uh, vanguard of the marchers coming in around the plaza surrounding Lincoln Memorial. We want first to go to uh, correspondent Dave Dugan, who is standing by along the parade route at 17th and Constitution. At this, at this particular spot, we had expected the marchers to just about now begin. However, some 15 minutes ago, the march got underway, and their enthusiasm, uh, particularly among the young people, is quite contagious. We've noticed a rather uh, a, a distinction between the young and the old. The, the older people, the ones in their 40s and 50s and upward, are uh, taking this somewhat as a, a church picnic outing. They brought their little lunch baskets, and they are very relaxed. When they see a television camera from time to time, they'll wave. But otherwise, they're taking it rather relaxed and calmly, and uh, they're uh, going off for a Sunday outing as if they were going on a church picnic. 
On the other hand, some of the young people who have been engaged in the more militant civil rights demonstrations are very familiar with all the freedom songs, and they can sing We Shall Overcome uh, very well as if they have done it for many, many times. So there is that unusual and uh, understood distinction between these two groups, and the young people are having a wonderful time uh, displaying their exuberance, as you can see, as they come down the street. was good-humored. No ill humor shown during the day. Most of the buses have, by this late hour, tonight, left Washington, and so have the trains. And there has been no violence. Early in the day, police did send self-styled fascist George Lincoln Rockwell packing back across the bridge to his headquarters in, Ar in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, one of his stormtroopers was arrested for addressing a crowd without a license. Inevitably, there was an anonymous bomb scare. Police sealed off the Washington Monument, searched it, found nothing, reopened it. Europe watched portions of the march live via satellite. Uh, Moscow television at one time had scheduled coverage, but five minutes before airtime, it changed its mind. No explanation of that. We want jobs. One of the demands in this march on Washington today, all of the demands underline the word now. The mood clearly expressed that there is no more time. Now is the time to act. of the march on Washington was political. Congress now has before it uh, Mr. Kennedy's, the administration's new civil rights bill. And today's march originated as a show of support for that legislation. Did it work? Correspondent Robert Pierpoint is in Washington with some knowledgeable members of the Congress who will try to answer that question. This is Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, like most Southern congressmen, a Democrat. Senator Thurmond, what is your feeling about this march today? Do you think it's going to help the Negroes attain their goals? No, I do not. Uh, Negroes have as many rights in this country as other people. They're better fed, they're better housed, and they enjoy as many benefits as other people. They have every opportunity in the world here. They have more opportunities here than in any nation in the world. I don't know of any place where they have <clears throat> as good housing as many refrigerators, as many automobiles, as many dishwashers and washing machines as here in the United States. I feel that uh, they ought to be proud that they have the opportunity to live in a land of freedom and, and where they do have opportunity to accomplish as much as they have accomplished. No nation in history has accomplished as much as the Negro race in America in the last 100 years. 
Senator Thurman, uh, I gather then that you feel that the president's civil rights program is actually not needed. I don't think it's needed, and furthermore, I think it's unconstitutional. Do you think that the march will have any effect on Congress itself? I presume that's their purpose in coming to Washington to, ex to exact pressure on the Congress to pass this unconstitutional and unwise legislation. However, it will not have that effect. They can bring a million people here, and I don't think it will change the votes of a single congressman, whether he's for or against the legislation. This is Senator Philip Hart of Michigan. Like Senator Thurman, whom we interviewed a little earlier in the program, he is a Democrat, but a Democrat with somewhat differing views. Uh, Senator Hart, let's ask you, first of all, the same thing that we asked Senator Thurman. How do you feel about the march today, and do you think it'll help the Negroes attain their goals? I think the march is an excellent thing, and let's remember that it's a march of all Americans. It isn't a Negro march alone. It's a march made up of uh, the leadership of the religious community of this country, and I think it's all to the good. Do you think that the march today will change any votes uh, here on the Hill on the president's civil rights program? I doubt that. Uh, I would doubt if anybody would be uh, overwhelmed either way by a show of uh, numbers or a lack of numbers. But more importantly, I think it crystallizes uh, in a very dramatic fashion the awareness of all peoples across the country that, that we don't practice here at home what we preach to the rest of the world we stand for, and now is the time to get busy to do that which we preach we do. Much of what was said and done in this city today was directed at Congress, but much of Congress simply was not paying attention. Only half a dozen speeches here on Capitol Hill even referred to the march. Perhaps this was partly because Congress today was preoccupied with the bill to settle the railroad controversy. And it could be a peculiar quirk of fate that the march on Washington actually speeded up passage and helped avoid a railway strike. At least more than one congressman worried over the specter of thousands of Negro demonstrators stranded in Washington if the railroad controversy wasn't settled tonight. Normally the halls of this Capitol building are literally alive with tourists this time of year, but apparently because of the march, they stayed away in droves today, and almost the only people you could meet here were congressmen. Most of them had strong views on the march, depending largely on whether they were for or against the president's civil rights program. But almost all agreed on one essential point. The march itself would not influence many, if any, congressmen's votes. Only the reactions of the voters at home to the march would do that, and they have yet to be heard from. This is Robert Pierpoint at the U.S. Capitol. If the attitude of Congress was divided, the attitude at the White House was not. From the start, the president has been favorably inclined. At a news conference early this summer, he vigorously defended the right of the civil writers to parade in the Capitol. And last week, he announced that he would meet with the leaders of the march in the White House. And this afternoon, he kept that promise. In the lead, Martin Luther King, the man hailed today above all the others by the civil rights marchers, as you heard. And with him, Walter Ruther, whose United Auto Workers Union helped organize the march and sent an enormous delegation. The 10 leaders spent an hour and a quarter with the president and top administration officials. Afterward, President Kennedy issued a statement. He praised both the leaders and the marchers for their careful preparation and orderly conduct. He said, one cannot help but be impressed with the deep fervor and the quiet dignity that characterizes the thousands who have gathered in the Capitol from across the country to demonstrate their faith and confidence in our democratic form of government, end quote. He promised that the government will continue its efforts to obtain increased employment and eliminate discriminatory practices. This summer, he said, has seen remarkable progress on civil rights, but he added, we have a very long way yet to travel. Afterward, the 10 leaders met reporters outside the White House, and Mr. King had this to say. The well, the president made it very clear that we would need very strong bipartisan support if we're to get uh, civil rights legislation this year. There are some Republicans who are already committed, and there are some Democrats who are already committed. And the job ahead is to get some of the individuals in both parties who are still a little on the fence 
to come over in a positive way and support this legislation. There are certainly some few individuals who are decisive in this, uh, but the basic point is, and the president made this very clear, that it must have bipartisan support if it is to get through. The president and the leaders of the March on Washington. Eric Severide has been observing the day's events in Washington, and here now is his report. The march in, not on Washington, was precisely what its leaders called for. It was orderly but not subservient, proud but not arrogant, outspoken but not raucous. It had all the combined elements of a political rally, a revival meeting, and a Fourth of July picnic. This was the biggest gathering of American Negroes in their 300 years in this country. But at times today, there seemed almost as many whites as Negroes in the crowd. We cannot march alone, said Martin Luther King. It seemed clear this evening that they will not have to. This meeting was evident that the Negro cause is becoming a general and universal cause. It was evidence also that one phrase in the invocation, the meek shall inherit the earth, requires a little amplification when they cease being meek. But today's phenomenon was not of itself evidence that Congress will pass the president's civil rights bill. No informed person here tonight was prepared to bet on that. And this is one reason for the theme that ran through most of today's speeches that was expressed over and over again privately on the sidelines where the leaders gathered with reporters. And that is that this march is not the culmination of the Negro struggle for equal rights. Their leaders have no intention of resting on their oars. They know and they fear that if after today's high peak of emotion, the mass of ordinary Negroes see no improvement in their lives, then there will be frustration, bitterness, and real trouble. So they intend to keep their momentum going, and some of them are now talking of a march through Alabama as their next demonstration of the determination that the American society shall have no rest until it is a society of free men whatever their color. This is Eric Severide in Washington. As the multitude stood today at the marble feet of Abraham Lincoln, its members might have reflected that it has been 100 long years since the great emancipator proclaimed the Negro's freedom. It has been only eight year, short years since a group of determined and daring Negroes in Montgomery, Alabama, boycotted that city's buses in protest against back-of-the-bus segregation. That was the first public demonstration that by today had swelled to this march on Washington. The momentum of change seems to be accelerating. And in the hearts of 21 million American Negroes and untold millions of sympathetic whites, there beat tonight the hope that the dream of Negro equality was at last overtaking the reality of history. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night.